Hey, what up all my tooth doctors and doctresses? Welcome to another video at the Tooth Factory. So let's continue our central nervous system pharmacology series with antipsychotics. Dr. Kanisha has put together a brand new lecture for us and I will be presenting it to you. Today's table of contents is antipsychotics. We'll also discuss what is schizophrenia and how it's associated with psychosis. Then we'll classify the antipsychotics first and second generation in detail. We'll learn about the mechanism of action, therapeutic effects, adverse effects, and then summarize the entire presentation, followed by references. So, just to kind of get us warmed up, what are the common symptoms of psychosis? We got hallucinations, delusions, and disordered thoughts. So hallucination could be something we see, hear, touch, smell, or taste. That is not real. That's hallucination. Delusions could be paranoia, as if someone's trying to get us and disordered thoughts such as rapid speech, disturbed speech, and losing a train of thought. That's psychosis. So before we begin and dive into psychosis, it's always important to understand the basis. What is the central nervous system? Well, it contains brain and spinal cord. The balance of various neurotransmitters would elicit various actions, unlike the parasympathetic nervous system where there's only acetylcholine and norepinephrine, as we've learned in the previous lectures. So there's a lot of neurotransmitters, and by various, we mean there's dopamine, there's norepinephrine, as well as serotonin, and that is 5-HT for short. The movement of the body and the behavioral pattern of the body is what CNS is all about, and we've discussed much of it in the previous lectures. For example, when we had neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's discussed, right? Parkinson's is when there's a lack of dopamine activity in the brain. That prevents us from controlling our movements. Correct? That was Parkinson's. Today we're going to be talking about psychosis. Psychosis is where there's overstimulation of the CNS, right? at the emotional quotient of it, of course. The convulsions, epilepsies, that's our next lecture. We talked about anxiety, depression, hypnosis. We will also later talk about drug abuses and other dependencies such as CNS, stimulants in the future lectures as well. Now, how do we solve all of this? Our goal is achieved by two things. One is to balance neurotransmissions. In this case, for example, if it's Parkinson's, and the cause is decrease in dopamine, we want to increase dopamine as a treatment, and therefore we treat it with levodopa. As simple as that. That will either excite or inhibit the receptors that are at the target organs. That's the basics of central nervous system, right? The most important method of mastering the CNS pharma is to be able to understand the basic concepts. And at the Tooth Factory, that's what we help you do. So, Speaking of the basics, the balance of excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons is very important. The balance between depolarization action and hyperpolarization action, which is either giving action potential or inhibiting action potential, whereas it's conducted by influx and efflux of various ions in the presynaptic vesicle. That will then decide, should I send a signal out or should I not send a signal out? In today's lecture for psychosis, our neurotransmitters in discussion are dopamine and serotonin. So speaking of which, mesolimbic pathway is our discussion topic today. It's the function of dopamine transport that gives pleasure, reward, motivational functions. Too much of it can lead to psychosis. Therefore, it's the behavioral traits that we need to discuss when we talk about dopamine balancing with serotonin. Negrostriatal, we've already talked about this in our Parkinson's lecture, where it's the movement, the locomotion that is affected, and that's between dopamine and acetylcholine. Please go visit our lecture, the Parkinson's lecture, Introduction to CNS Pharmacology, and that's where it's at. Okay, general perspective. What is anxiety? Anxiety is just tension, apprehension, uneasiness, fear, which is unknown. It activates the sympathetic nervous system, such as tachycardia, sweating, and palpitations. Depression is the inability to experience pleasures that usually existed for us in our lives. 
their sadness, hopelessness, all the way down to where we feel suicidal. That's depression. We Again, we have lectures on these as well, so please go check them out, you guys. And what are psychosis and mania? This is today. Bipolar disorder, recognition disorders are very similar. But schizophrenia is a form of psychosis. And mania also goes hand in hand. Because they all have to do with a lot of anger, a lot of hallucinations, de delusions, and rapid thought speech patterns. So let's talk about antipsychotics as an overview. So let's understand what that is. First things first. These drugs are not curatives. Antipsychotics are not curative drugs. They merely eliminate the symptoms of psychosis. Say, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia happens when there is a lot of dopamine and serotonin in the body. Now, here's a clue. When there is a lot of dopamine and a lot of serotonin, it leads to a form of psychosis. Perfect? That's what we learned from that sentence. The concept of psychosis is simple. Dopamine is a rewarding neurotransmitter. D2 receptors is a dopaminergic receptor, which regulates the amount of dopamine which is synthesized. Where is it synthesized? Substantia nigra. That's a location in the brain where dopamine is synthesized and D2 receptors, when activated, they say make more dopamine. But antipsychotic drugs are known to block these D2 receptors and th that would end up preventing the action of dopamine on D2 receptors. Much like here. In the presynaptic vesicle, dopamine exists, ions move in, and dopamine comes out into the synapse, but antipsychotics would win the race, sit itself down on the D2 receptors, and block them. And dopamine is left alone by itself, decreasing intracellular response. So ultimately, it decreases dopaminergic activity. Therefore, if psychosis is increasing dopamine, then wouldn't the treatment be decreasing dopamine? Well, absolutely. But this is only useful when we have excessive action of dopaminergic activity. If it's normal, that will lead to a lot of problems because we would have then plummeted the dopamine way below average amount, right? There is an excessive CNS stimulation leading to hallucination and delusion. Only in that case, we can use antipsychotic drugs. Otherwise, there are a lot of issues that follow, and we'll take a look at all of them in a bit. Now I have a simple question for you. What happens when we get out of control happy? What happens? Well, we lose emotional and all sorts of control over our bodies, and we start seeking surreal visuals and excitement, and we, we people look at us and we commonly are referred to as, wow, you're gone crazy. Well, that exactly, in the language of pharmacology, is psychosis. So. These drugs literally control those symptoms. Unfortunately, they come with a baggage of side effects due to blocking actions of antipsychotics not being limited to just D2 receptors. That's right. Antipsychotics like to sit on anticholinergic activities, antiadrenergic, antiserotonin, antihistamine, and so much more. So, is it a good drug or a bad? Well, it's absolutely not curative. It only eliminates the symptoms of psychosis when it attaches to D2 receptors. That's all. Other than that, all of it is side effects. So let's take a deeper look. Let's classify them. First generation and second generation. First generation have two sections, low potency, high potency. They're also known as conventional, typical, and traditional antipsychotic drugs. We know that their target is D2 receptors and they will block them. But they come across what is known as extrapyramidal symptoms, which is dopamine dependent Parkinson effect. Now keep this in mind. We will explain this much better in detail in the next slide. First generation high potency and first generation low potency. Low potency includes chlorpromazine, whereas high potency includes pro chlorprazine and halperidol. Okay, 
how do you remember all of these? Well, it's very hard to. But if you were to pick up one or two names from each of them, it would be easy for us to recognize them during our studies. For example, low potency has chlorpromazine and thioridazine, right? Whereas high potency has a halperidol. Halperidol is a very common drug in high potency. And so is thiothysine. Okay, second generation, we have clozapine, olanzapine, and resperidone, ziprasidone. So, apines and idones. Apines and idones. Okay, these are second. Second generation are known as atypical. Why are they atypical? Because typically, we only block D2 receptors. But these are atypical. They have to block something else. And that is serotonin. Second generation is block serotonin. Now, let me backtrack a little bit. What is schizophrenia? High dopamine and high serotonin? They block dopamine and block serotonin? Well, then these become the first line drugs of schizophrenia. Absolutely. Second generation antipsychotics are first line schizophrenia. Okay, let's take a look at that in detail. Before I move into this little word here, I'm going to discuss this diagram. I want to explain Parkinson's disease just a little bit here because what happens is this blue, blue dot here is called substantia nigra. It is a dopamine producing cell of the body and it is a family member of what is called as extrapyramidal pathways. They include spinal cord as well. Now, here's the thing. When dopamine is created at substantia nigra, then everything's happy. We have controlled movements of our body. Okay? Controlled movements of our body. However, if as soon as this is reduced, you know, how antipsychotics block substantia nigra's dopamine synthesis, well, dopamine reduces, and all of a sudden, we have uncontrolled movements. And in other words, that is known as extrapyramidal symptoms. That's what happens. So, if we read this information here, it would be more clear for us. They're known as conventional, typical, traditional, we know that. They're competitive inhibitors at various receptors, we also know that. Main effect at D2, just covered that. It blocks dopamine attachment, but it specifically blocks extrapyramidal pathways. And then we have extrapyramidal symptoms. They're associated with movement, like in Parkinson's. Halperidol and chlorpromazine are responsible for that because they're both first generation. Halperidol is highly potent and chlorpromazine is less potent. But extrapyramidal symptoms definitely occur. So just a reminder, what is extrapyramidal symptom or system? It has a part called substantia nigra which gives birth to dopamine. So if dopamine is decreased, we have Parkinson's disease. Okay, so let's keep that rule in mind. Whenever there is lack of dopamine, there is lack of controlled movement. And it creates Parkinson-like effect. And other words of Parkinson-like effect is extrapyramidal symptoms, EPS. Okay, so first generation antipsychotic drugs are responsible for EPS as their side effect. Okay, second generation. So I know I took some time in explaining that, but it was a very important concept, you guys. This is second generation antipsychotics. Generally, it's atypical, right? It's called atypical. There's a lower incidence of extra pyramidal system, so that's great lower incidence but it has its own issues right has a higher incidence of metabolic effects by metabolic we're talking about exacerbation of diabetes hypercholesterolemia and weight gain so metabolically speaking there's increase in 
diabetes, increase in weight, and increase in cholesterol. Why would all of that happen? Well, because it targets dopamine as well as serotonin receptors. However, it's good because schizophrenia has both dopamine and serotonin that are high in amount. So second generation is the drug of choice. But as a side effect, of course, metabolic issues will occur. But it's better than extra pyramidal side effects in many ways. Perfect. Awesome. So antipsychotic mechanism of action. We now know that there is a competitive binding at D2 receptors, then preventing dopamine from acting at the dopamine receptors, leading to a decrease in intracellular response. CNS goes down, dopamine goes down, in some cases serotonin goes down as well. Right? So dopamine antagonism. All first generation drugs block D2. Most second generation block D2. Serotonin only second generation block serotonin receptors. Other antagonism we have cholinergic, adrenergic, histaminic systems blocked. So we have anti muscarinic action, anti alpha adrenergic action, and anti histaminic action as well. Here's a pictorial diagram to depict that. For example, all, particularly haloperidol, which is highly potent first generation. It blocks dopamine receptors. Perfect. But what about cholinergic muscarinic receptors? Blocked by chlorpromazine. Particularly chlorpromazine one more time at alpha receptors. Risperidone and clozapine, these are second generation, remember, because they block serotonin, so only second generations. Particularly chlorpromazine again and clozapine block histaminic, so both first generation and second generation block this. So let's say all, all, second, first, first. Perfect. So please write that down, guys, because that will help us understand the next slide, which are antipsychotic clinical effects. Antipsychotic clinical effects are decreased in hallucinations, delusions, treating schizophrenia, followed by negative symptoms such as impaired attention and cognitive impairment as a result of CNS activity being reduced, extrapyramidal side effects such as the first generation's antipsychotics, dystonia, Parkinson-like effect, and again, please watch our first lecture for Parkinson's to understand more of it. There's motor restlessness, then there's tardive dyskinesia, involuntary movement, there's anti-emetic effect. Now, how is that? Well, where antipsychotic drugs act, which is at D2 receptors, there are some D2 receptors close to chemoreceptor trigger zone in the brain. That is responsible, normally, for causing vomiting. But because antipsychotics block those D2 receptors, chemoreceptor trigger zone is blocked, and therefore, vomit is blocked and that causes anti-emetic effects. Then there's anticholinergic effects. It can cause blurred vision, dry mouth, confusion, GI and urinary tract inhibition, smooth muscle inhibition, and it also balances extrapyramidal symptoms. The exception is clozapine. That actually increases saliva. Only exception. So write that down, you guys. And other effects are orthostatic hypotension caused when alpha blocking activity occurs. There is a kilothermia, which is varying temperatures according to varying environments. There's increase in prolactin when D2 receptors in the pituitary gland are blocked. There's sedation when antihistaminic activity occurs and sexual dysfunction as well. If we look at these different photographs here that show us, and these are from the references as well, you guys, that cancer chemotherapy, vertigo, and motion sickness can all cause nausea and vomiting. But these antipsychotic drugs mentioned here are responsible for nausea that is associated with a specific condition. 
So if, for example, motion sickness caused nausea, scopolamine will block it. If vertigo caused nausea, these drugs will block it. If cancer chemotherapy caused nausea, haloperidol will block it. And that's the clinical effect of the drugs. Okay, they're used for nausea caused by different conditions. So overall speaking, to summarize the therapeutic uses, when should we use antipsychotic drugs? Schizophrenia, bipolar, refractory depression. The term refractory means that depression was treated, but it came back. That treatment did not work. Therefore, we, we, we can use antipsychotic drugs. Used for hiccups, irritability due to autism, nausea vomiting, we looked at that in detail just now, and act as tranquilizers. Pharmacokinetics, they are absorbed variably in the stomach and intestine and so on. It is increased with food. Distribution is crossing blood-brain barrier, largely distributed in the brain, very important because it's a CNS pharmacology. Metabolism and elimination is through the CYP450 family, specifically 2D6, 1A2, 3A4 enzymes. Active metabolites such as paliperidone is an active metabolite of risperidone, and these are second generation, right? I don't. I don't. There are long acting injectables available that increase bioavailability all the way up to two to four weeks to treat psychosis as well. Now, adverse effects. We must all just be very aware of these now, right? Extra pyramidal effects. And I've said this a lot of times, so I know I've already bored you guys, but they're very important. Very, very important. Uh, dry mouth, urinary retention, and constipation because GI and urinary tract is blocked. CNS depression and confusion and blurriness. Tardative dyskinesia, which is a fly catching tongue and jaw, says Lippincott. That's our reference. And neuroleptic malignant syndrome, fatal muscle rigidity, and unstable blood pressure is also noted. So we got urinary retention, weight gain, dry mouth, arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death, postural hypotension, extrapyramidal effects, sedation, you know, CNS depression, seizures, and dysfunction sexually. These charts are just summaries. This first one here is for the first generation antipsychotics. We got chlorpromazine and haloperidol. Again, low potency, high potency. These are just descriptive notes if you guys want to pause here and take a look at them. They have been explained in the lecture as well, but I've left them here because the chart is so well depicted from our references, so we thought would make a slide for each of them for first and this being the second generation, right? For example, we got apines and we got idones, right? Here we go, here we go. So these are the second generation. Again, these have been explained, but for more detailed, these charts can help you take some notes down as well. Our references for today's lecture are Lippincott and Little and Phallus, and the links for these are in the description box below. Thank you for watching today's lecture for Antipsychotics.